So, um, what I will talk about is, is because it's funny time, no equations, no variables, no parameters, no space, and no time. Obviously, I have to explain what I mean by this. In the informal free stop me. And uh, obviously, there's a big learning to do the work, like the postdocs and the students. And then over the years, there is collaborators like Rafi Kreisman. And then two year passed away last year. We worked together for a long time, maybe 20 years. It was great. That was. Um, this is my typical slide at the beginning. I stole it from Julio Tino at Northwestern. Julio says there are simple systems, a few degrees of freedom, a few variables, complicated systems, many degrees of freedom, and every degree is doing a particular job. And then complex systems, many degrees of freedom, many fishes, many people, many molecules, but they're more or less interchangeable and somehow order emerges from their interactions. He did this slide because he wanted to contrast complicated with complex. And I really did it because I wanted to say that what we think of as simple is not at all simple. A billiard ball is extremely complex if you think of it as atoms. But if you were trying to model it as atoms in order to play pool, you would never get to play pool. So simple is really in the higher of the beholder. Uh, simple are the systems that are complex, but we can usefully model with a few degrees of freedom. Usefully for us, for what we want to use the models for. And my example of the equation free stuff for complex systems comes from the work of Tony Roberts, who is a very bright guy in Australia, a mathematician. He was working 20 years ago on plankton. And here is two different views of the same thing. This is uh, 20,000 dots when they start, then they change their number. Each one of them is supposed to be a plankton microorganism at the surface of the ocean. And this is the right macroscopic observable, the pair correlation function we tell you how many neighbors you have as a, on average as a function of the size of the neighborhood. And if I play this movie, so let me kind of get here and play it, then let me stop it. What you see on the left is something really horrible, dots running all around each one of them. They do a random work, they give birth, they die, and they're switched around by the ocean. But if you look at the pair correlation function, which is a macroscopic observable of interest, then you will see that it has a pretty nice evolution, uh, like a partial differential equation that goes to a steady state after some time, maybe with a little bit of noise. So the point is, if we have micro models, we're kind of doomed to simulate and show movies. But if we have macro laws for the statistics, then we can do stability analysis, we can do sensitivities, we can do also simulation, but we can do all kinds of additional things. And it's important to have this bridge between micro and macro. Usually we get the macro because somebody is brilliant enough to figure out first what the right macroscopic observable is, here the pair correlation function, and second, to drive tools for the equation for the evolution of the macroscopic observable of interest. We built here a long time ago. What we started wondering is what if I have micro simulators but i don't have macro equations i am sure that if i was very bright i would be able to derive a macroscopic equation let's say for particle density but i don't know the equation for particle density i only know particles well if i want to integrate this equation for particle density but i don't know how to write it down for a given initial condition i would need a slope so that i can take an Euler step Yes, but the slope needs the equation, and I don't have the equation. Okay, what can I do? I can take the initial condition, make particles that have this density field, run the particles, because that's the goal that I have, observe as the particles run, how the density evolves, estimate the time derivative on the fly, and then make a jump of where the density is going to be tomorrow. Then I start again, take this density, make it particles, run a little bit, and jump. What do I gain? I only do brief bursts of simulation with the particles, and then I can take big jumps at the macro level because the macro quantities are slow. And I don't really care about what the particles are. I really care about where the macroscopic observable is going to be. So I am doing forward Euler. It's just that this forward Euler, the slope, does not come from a formula. It comes from a brief computational experiment and then a jump. So the idea is to use the microcode like an experiment that you have in your pocket and really do design of experiments. In the same way that the forward order is a sequence of function evaluations, well, this course projected forward order is a sequence of brief bursts 
post-processing, and then jump. So this is, this is what we call the equation free. It is not exactly equation free because we have equations at the micro level, at the level of the particle. It's at the macro level that we don't have closed the equations. And that was maybe 20 something years ago. And then maybe around, I don't know, uh, less than 20 something years ago, there was this idea of variable free. If we have lots of particles, how do we describe them? We can describe them by, for example, taking moments of the distribution. You take enough moments, you will describe the particle. But what if the behavior is lower dimension? That's something that we've been working with at least, for example, for more than 10 years. So if you have a micro problem with many degrees of freedom, but you believe you can write a macro description with only a few degrees of freedom, a reduced order model that's useful, how do you know what are the right things to observe? And sometimes people know this from experience or expertise, and sometimes they know it because somebody told them. Sometimes they know it because somebody is brilliant and actually does the work to go from the Boltzmann equation to the number of stokes. But the difference is that also sometimes people know what the right things to observe are, but they cannot exactly describe them. You know, we all put our retirement money in some fund, and we hope that the guy who, or the lady who runs the fund know how to predict the market better. Now, can they exactly say what it is that they are observing? Maybe yes, sometimes maybe no, but they certainly know what to observe in order to be able to make a better predict. And the whole idea is that for the last maybe, I don't know, of the order of 15 to 20 years, we can use machine learning and in particular data science, manifold learning in order to find the right observables from data. And our particular poison is diffusion maps in this talk because I work with Arctic Poison, as I told you, for a very long time, around 150 years, I think people have been doing principal components take three-dimensional data that are really two-dimensional and describe them with only two numbers projecting on the principal components. Okay, this is not a big deal going from three to two. The idea is to go from 5,000 or 5 million to three to two. And then um, this is something that we did in 1992, and it comes from a paper. So this is my first reference from protoencoder. This is a chemical engineer who was a professor at MIT and did not get tenure. And in 1991, he wrote in a chemical engineering journal a paper called Nonlinear Principal Component Analysis. He created these bottleneck architectures, and the idea is that if you have 40 variables, but you can train this bottleneck shaped network to learn the identity, then you can take the 40 variables down to three with an encoder and from three variables back to 40. And uh, he called them nonlinear principal components, and today we call them auto and bottle in the networks, and now we call them auto encoders. So, this is a way of taking high dimensional data and trying to find a low dimensional description in a data driven way. Let me say that when we used this in the very early 90s, solving this problem was inconceivably difficult. It was a nonlinear, non convex optimization problem. And if it didn't work, sometimes the computer crashed. It took a week for a mirror to kind of make one run. And if things crashed, you didn't know, was it a mistake in the code? Was it that the problem was not reducible? Was it that you didn't have a good training algorithm? Was it that you didn't run long enough? So something that was extremely difficult back then, everybody does with like two minutes of programming now because of the software tools that we have. And then around 2000, there was something that I thought was an absolute miracle. There were two papers back to back in science magazine. One was on local linear embedding, and the first one was on isomap. And people for the first time were able to find low dimensional description, not for hyperplanes, but for curved surfaces. So this is like the Swiss roll. It is two dimensional, but the data are three dimensional. And uh, you can formulate an eigen problem. That's what diffusion maps do. Um, if you, when we, it was quite fun in Lafon, and before that, Belkin and Yogi, uh, you know, Laplace and, Laplace and Eigen maps. And um, the idea was that you can take data that are effectively two dimensional and not only realize that they're two dimensional, but actually find a parametrization of these two dimensional manifolds. Why is that important in modeling? Because any dynamics in three dimensions on this manifold. Can be described as dynamics of the phi two and phi three variables on this twin. 
And so please think of this. What was before a nonlinear, non convex problem with difficult to solve suddenly became an eigenproblem with a unique, nice solution that you can compute. And I think it's ironic that these days the people that get the idea for doing this, when they have to do reduction, they use auto encoders because it's much faster and much easier to program and does a very good job. So this is the variable free part. If you don't know what the right variables are, you find them by doing machine learning, whether auto encoders or diffusion maps or isomap. And of course, five two and five three, they are messy data driven variables. They don't necessarily have an easy interpretation, but you can always check whether they are one to one with physical variables. So you find the two variables that are important, and then you go to your friend who knows about the physics and say two things are important. Can you have some suggestions of pairs of things that might be relevant? And they suggest various pairs. And then you check that the things that you found and the things that come from learning, learning, not machine learning, are one to one with each other in the data. And if you have many different pairs, then you choose the one that has the best flip sheets, that is nicer, nicer one to one flip. My favorite example in this is uh, for those of you that are chemical engineers or engineers, is think of an adiabatic reaction. You have an adiabatic reaction in a closed box, all the heat of the reaction goes to raising the temperature. So whether you have the conversion of the reaction or whether you have the temperature of the reactor, they're one to one with each other. Now you can think of somebody who measures only temperatures and makes a model based only on temperatures. You can think somebody who measures only concentrations makes a model based on your conversions and you can maybe think somebody who measures the viscosity of the solution and makes a model based on the viscosity of the solution all of these people are saying the same thing because they're all one to one with each other but i think you can imagine a conference in which they would shoot each other you know, you idiot. the temperature is important you idiot. It is the viscosity of the solution is important. so there's many many different parameterizations of the same thing and so now I'm going to show you some old stuff. And this is a paper from 1992 where we used autoencoders in order to learn dynamical systems with neural networks and machine learning. The paper has a horrific title Discrete versus Continuous Time Nonlinear Signal Processing of Copper Electrode Solution Data. And if you wanted to look for neural network architectures in this paper, you definitely would not say that from the title. Jack Hudson was the guy in whose lab the experiments were done. What were the experiments? The experiments were time series at different parameter values that you get by taking a piece of metal, in particular copper, and putting it in hydrochloric acid, and then having a potential between the metal and the counter electrode. These are time series. They are time series of the current, that is the dissolution rate, the reaction rate, how quickly this thing is dissolved. You can look for some parameter values, you get steady behavior in time. And for some, you get periodic. And for some, you get messier periodic. And for some, you get even messier periodic. You can do the factor reconstruction with time delays. You recognize that you have a steady state, and then a hop to a limit cycle, and then a period doubling. And then here, you can kind of maybe see a period four, and then you get chaotic stuff. And so the idea is we have all of these data as they come out of the experiments. How do we make a data-driven model that can reproduce and help us examine the data. And so here is something I was talking to. Here is my first example. So this is a 1992 paper of what I, time goes on, I more and more believe is true. I would posit, and I would be happy to be proven wrong, that most or all of the beautiful architectures that the computer scientists find for processing data. They are really numerical algorithms that we know and love and have coded and can do. So, this is a Runge-Kutta fourth order. You take an initial condition, you calculate f of y, you call that k1. You multiply it with a small number, h is the step, you add it to the initial condition, you evaluate f again. Call that k2. You take that, you multiply it with a small number, add it to the initial condition, evaluate k. Look at this neural network here that we made and we published in 1992. Here's the initial condition. We pass through a neural network and get the number. We multiply it with a fixed h over two. 
added to the initial condition, pass it through the same neural network. These are four copies of the same network. So this is a recurrent network. You do it four times and then look at the end. The new prediction is the old plus a linear combination, something that gives in the span of all of these k's. So what is the point? If you have data, you train this neural network to fit the data. So what you're finding is the right hand side of an equation such that if you do longitude on this equation, you get the data that you're observing experimentally. So this is a way of learning the dynamical system that produces the time series. So this is a recurrent network. And not only that, it's a resident, it's a residual network because what you learn from the neural network is not the solution. It is the difference between what you started, the residual between what you started and what you finished. So this runge kutra residual network was published in 1992, and it has a pretty decent 100 citations since. This neural network, the first resonant, which was published by Microsoft in 2015, please look at it. You take an initial condition, you evaluate the function of it, you multiply it with a small number, and then you just add it to the initial condition and want to reproduce the data. This architecture, does it remind you of some integrator? What is the integrator? You calculate f of x multiplied by a small number and add it to x. Euler. Forward Euler. Yeah. Okay. Forward Euler is a neural network architecture. In eight years, has how many citations? Make a guess. 35,000. 150. Last week, yes. Uh, what I'm trying to say, of course, they, they did more and they used it in image processing and whatever. But all I'm trying to tell you is not that I published it before them, nor that what they did is not important. I'm just trying to point out that a couple of very important architectures that arise in computer scientists science, they are already in the numerical analysis that so you use every day. So this is the neural ODE paper. This is not the neural ODE paper. This is the resonant paper. The neural ODE does not use a particular integrator like Euler. Or integrator. It, it calls an integrator. We can discuss. That was also. Yeah. So, you know, at some point I'm thinking, should I write the paper saying that, you know, end years ago we did all of this stuff? But that's not the point. The big thing about the neural OD paper is that it does not back propagate through, but it uses the adjoint in order to back propagate. But never, it, they are good things, all of them. My point is not that they are not good, nor that they don't know the literature. Maybe they don't, but it doesn't matter. The point is that these architectures are in our numerical analysis. But a, lot, a lot of things are being rediscovered. Sure, nice. That's, that's, I just hope that if I do this, it is unbeknownst to me, and if I figure it out, I can say that this was done before. Okay. Anyway, you can also appreciate the sour grape. Like, wait a minute, I didn't. We put that in 1990. Why don't I have you know 150,000 citations? Anyway, now remember that they had one time series, one the reaction rate. Yeah, but in order to get the cosmic dynamics, you know that you need these three variables. So where did these variables come from? They came from taking windows of the time series, using Otto and Kohlberg, which were published the year before, finding three nonlinear principal components of the time series windows, and then learning the differential equations in Latin space, that is in the space of the nonlinear principal components. And by doing this, we learned a parameter dependent set of three nonlinear differential equations that were capable of reproducing the time series and the attractors and gave us the bifurcation diagram. Please remember, you do the integration in Latin space with these components, and then you pass through the decoder and you get the actual time series. So you go back to full physical space. There is some other key things about this and bifurcation, but in the same spirit, things that we did back then, I want you to just look at this picture. This picture is a neural network where the output feeds back as a constraint to some of the inputs. If you look at the top and you look at the formula, you will recognize Crank Nicholson. So implicit neural networks would be implicit integration networks, and they need different ways to be trained. And another thing that we did back then is to say, well, if I have a dynamical system, 
And a lot of the physical terms I know, but there is this red term, which happens to be difficult to know physically. Oh, gee, then I will do a gray box. I will hardwire a lot of the physics, and I will only learn the part of the physics that I don't know. And we also did PDEs. This is nice, and the Dries may remember those times when Katarina was a postdoc. So Katarina Kretscher, who now is a professor in Munich, comes to Princeton and brings a VHS tape that, that has these snapshots. This is uh, CO oxidation on platinum. It's what happens on the catalyst of your car. What you see, for those of you that don't have electric car. Um, uh, so this is maybe 500 by 500 microns. Red is oxygen and blue is carbon monoxide. And as time goes on, the movie plays and you come back to yourself. And after another half period, you come back to yourself and shift. This is a nice bifurcation with symmetry. So you take these image series, you do principal components for them, you turn, you find that there's four principal components that are important, and then the whole movie becomes four time series. And what we did is that we use time delay embeddings in order to learn the differential equation. Actually, here we learn the time one not that evolves the dynamic. So you take a snapshot, you make it four numbers, and the four previous numbers, you give it to this, and what it does is that it just happens to do a good job in reproducing the fraction. This is just fitting the data. I again just want to show you an example of having a PD with a low dimensional Latin space, finding the Latin space with standard PCA, and then learning a differential equation, a sort of approximate inertial form on this Latin space. And this is because at the time we both Idris and I were visiting to Asalamu. So these are quasi periodic, this is Poincare maps of uh, uh, Rayleigh Bernard convection in liquid helium, super split liquid helium. They're just quasi periodic solutions. So these things are sections of tori. And then what we did is that we took the experimental data. This neuron is a Rayleigh number. This is the Poincare map coordinates with some history. And we were able to use this in order to reproduce the bifurcation diagram that both Eki got in his experiment. For those of you that have played and know about quasi periodic regimes, you will see frequency lockings on the torus as you go. So, this is all black box ODE or PDE stuff. Uh, but in the Latin space, we learn ordinary differential equations. Then, what we did is to try and find and learn partial differential equations, which is again very hard. So, this is a paper from 1998. And I'd like you to think of a parabolic PD. What's a parabolic PD? It's a relation between the time derivative and the value of the function, a few spatial derivatives and a parameter. Uh, but if you have a movie, at every point in space time, you know what these things are and you know what this thing is. And therefore, you can train a neural network not to learn the solution of the PD. A lot of the stuff that you see today is learning the solution of the PD. This is learning as a law of the PD, appro learning, approximating the law of the problem. <laughs> so here's another one of these cases. This is from this 1998 paper. You take a stencil of five points, you use finite differences to get the derivatives. And then knowing the derivatives and the corresponding time derivative, you train a neural network with the parameter also possibly as an input so that you can learn the law of the partial differential equation. And if you have something at one stencil, then you slide it and you do the same thing at the next spatial point. And then you slide it and slide it and slide it. And you do all of this thing together. It's all the same network. And uh, I don't know how well I said it, but how do we call these networks today where we are paying attention not at the point, but some neighborhood of the point? This is a con so finite differences are convolutional neural networks, a very particular kind of convolutional neural networks. And so what we did is that we combine the convolutional neural networks in space with these recurrent residents in time to learn the right hand side of the PD to approximate the right hand side of the PD. And what you see here is a spatial temporal limit cycle of the Kramotosinski from the paper, and then how close the true solution and the learned right hand side dynamics are. Now, something a little more modern. For a long time, as you saw, we've been wondering about the case where there is macro PDEs, but we have micro <laughs> evolution laws. So the idea is, can we run particles and then try and learn macroscopic equations for the density? This example that I'm going to show you, uh, th this one here is lattice Boltzmann, but what I'm going to show you is just a little bit of something which is 
a very messy and very intricate and very elaborate random model of E. coli chemotaxis. Uh, it is a wonderful model was done by Hans Rothler and his collaborators at the University of Minnesota. Each of the bacteria is an agent, so this is an agent-based code. Each of the agents has two internal states, and then it has six discrete states that correspond to the flagellate. It's a miracle. If you don't know about it, look it up in Wikipedia how bacteria move. They have flagella, and if they flagella go counterclockwise, then they go in, they lock with each other, and the thing is running. If they go clockwise, then they spin apart, and the bacterium kind of tumbles and trying to decide where to go. So, in one dimension, bacteria go either right or left, or they tumble trying to decide where to go. And you run a large code with 5,000 of these bacteria, each of which is one set of two differential equations coupled with six discrete random variables. And what I'm going to show you is a simulation of 5,000 of these bacteria. You initialize them somewhere in space, like bacterium number one, bacterium number 5,000. This is the food field in which you put them. You start them a little bit to the left of the food field. What would you expect them to do? Move towards there is more, more food. As they move, because of all of this stochasticity, some of them go to the right, some of them go to the left, and some of them tumble in space. Look, this is a snapshot. What does it tell you that there is more bacteria going to the right on average than bacteria going to the left? Which way is the swarm going to move? There's more guys going left than right. This is probably going, sorry, I said it badly. There's more guys, I have to remember which way you look. If there is more guys going to the right than left, the swarm on average will move to the right, which makes sense because that's where there is more food. Okay, there's going to be two, I'm going to run it. You're going to see the simulation of the 5,000. And then here you're going to see in red the PDF of the actual bacteria, and in blue the learned PDE. Okay, you run it and you will see that they are not perfect. Sometimes you can see the red curve a little bit off. You notice that as they come close to the center with the highest food, the, the, the percentage of left going and right going starts becoming complex. So, this is a case where we learn the entire right hand side black box of the. Keller Zegel type equation. Here is a case that is gray box. We say, let's say that we know this term. Let's just start a line learning. So, this is a diffusion term. Let's say we know the diffusion term from a separate experiment. Let's just learn the chemotactic term. And that works also. If I played the movie, you would see the same kind of thing. So, what is it that I'm really telling you? What I'm really telling you is you have to have a sense of what is the nature of the model you're trying to learn. Are you trying to learn what he is? Are you trying to learn parabolic PDEs? As maybe uh, Ulysses does, are you trying to learn hyperbolic PDEs? Create a neural network architecture that is based on how you would solve the equation if you had it. And then train this neural network to learn the right hand side. This is to tell you that in addition to what these and PDs, the last few years, we've also learned stochastic differential equations. That is, you're trying to create an architecture that will learn the drift and the diffusivity from the data, the lot that is required for training this network. It's spiritually the same idea. You take your numerical integrator for stochastic problems and Euler Maruyama or a Milstein, that's what we had in the paper. We're working on point, which is an implicit stochastic integrator. And then you create a loss for this network. You run and train this. You learn the drift and the diffusivity. And then you look how well you did. This is a problem that has a little bit something to do with epidemics. Really, it is, it is really dynamics on a lattice. You will see there is three kinds of sites, you know, susceptible infected and recovered. Things run, and then you learn stochastic differential equations for the expected evolution of some of the statistics. Again, the point is not on the ESFPs or whatever. The point is that in all of these cases, the networks that you use are based on the numerical analysis algorithms that you would use if you had the problem. One more thing to say this is a, I don't have this plot, but it's in the corresponding paper. 
Let's say that this is the real model, true. And this is a numerical model, M. This is actual solving. This is numerical solving. M. I messed it up a little bit. Bear with me. So here is the true model. You can either get the perfect solution by actually solving the true model, or you can get a numerical solution by numerically solving the true problem. The difference between these things, what do we call it in the numerical analysis plan? Sorry for it. So this is error analysis. Yes. So this is, but it is forward error analysis. Now, is there another very interesting case? Here is a problem. So this is this is called the modified differential equation. Here is another equation whose true solution passes from the numerics of yours. Now you don't compare result with result. You compare dynamical systems with dynamical systems. This is backward error analysis or modified error analysis. What I showed you that we did back then is something yet different. What we have is having yet another model. This is the horrible name inverse modified differential equation. This is something whose numerical solution passes from the true points. And this thing is called inverse modified backward error analysis. And I would like to call it mirror error analysis for sure. But this is the kind of thing that the neural networks learn. The neural networks learn something which, when numerically integrated, passes from the true solution. And again, all I'm trying to tell you is that the kind of approximations and so on and so forth that we do, they are part of our numerical analysis. I must tell you, when I did numerical analysis, I didn't do any backward error analysis, but that also exists. <laughs> So this is all ma ma maximum error based on maximum error. Here, the error is in some norm between the right hand side of the one and the right hand side of the other. Is this more informative than the error in the results? Not necessarily. It's another way of trying to, to have a sense of how well you're doing. Do you look at what is the difference of your results from the other results, or do you have a sense of these two dynamical systems? If I kind of calculate some sort of L2 norm within them, is good enough or not good enough? The different way, it's a different observation of the same difference. Instead of looking at the output difference, you look at the input. Okay, I have a very, very short part. So I told you about no equations and no variables. I have a very, very short thing about no parameters. I'd like you to think of a problem in which we have two inputs, P1 and P2. And what we are interested in is a variable X which is a function of P1 and P2, and in particular, it's the product P1 times P2. Well, if we are interested in the product P1 times P2, then there exists entire level sets that have the same output, and therefore the parameters are non-identifiable. From data, you cannot tell what is P1 and what is P2. You can only tell the product. How do we do that in a data-driven way? Here is something that we are quite proud of. And it's a paper that Nikos Evangelou, my student, and others from my group put together. And even my son, George, has a little hand in this. So I would like you to think of a problem like this one that has several parameters, kf, kr, k cap, but in some regime, only one effective parameter that is a nonlinear combination of the other ones is important. If you have the formulas, you can figure out what the effective parameter is. If you don't have the formulas, but you can only simulate, how can you figure out what is the right dimension less parameter you want? What's how many parameters really matter and how many do not? So the way to do it, a way I'm doing this very quickly, take an initial condition and calculate short trajectories from all changing all of these parameters. If you look at the output, if only one combination is important, then you're not going to get a three-parameter family of outputs, you're going to get a one-parameter family of outputs. So you do these brief simulations, you do data mining on the results and figure out what's the dimensionality of the results, one. 
And now that you know that it is one, you create this very funny, it can be done by eigenproblems, but it's cute to do it with an autoencoder. So we make an autoencoder that goes from parameter space to a latent parameter space and back to the parameters to make sure we don't waste, we don't lose any information. Now remember, I said there's only one thing that matters in the output. So we take one of these latent neurons and train this latent neuron to learn the output. And the other two latent neurons, we ask them to be conformal. We ask for their sensitivity with respect to the inputs to be orthogonal to the one that matters to the output. When you do that, you find a data driven combination of the parameters that matter to the output. And then you find two other data driven combinations that parameterize the level set. That is, the things that if you change them, the output does not change. I wanted to call the paper on the things that do not matter. These two things, the, these two things are the things that do not matter. But we called it on the parameter combination that matter and those that don't. And this is something that is helpful. A in studying dimension with parameter reduction. And also there's a very particular, I didn't know that, but there is something what they call the simplographic optimization, where you first you do a minimum with respect to what you care, and then keeping that at the minimum, you try and optimize with the second objective. Okay, so now the, the, the more fun stuff, or the more weird stuff, no space and no time. In 2011, DARPA had a context, context. they called it the Shredder Challenge. What they did is that they took five documents, one was a handwritten, one was a typed memo, one was a sketch or whatever. They shredded it into little pieces, put the little pieces over the web, and asked, gave $50,000 to whoever would get the results back, to recreate the paper, the, the documents. It took a month for a company in San Francisco to get the $50,000. I'm amazed because the graduate students among us, and even the professors maybe sometimes can do this in 15 minutes. What the idea? You understand that this is a puzzle. And you are being asked to mathematically put the puzzle together back again. What's the main tool in putting puzzles together back again? Don't think so much of the little, you know how the pieces have these little things sticking out. Don't think so much that it is the smoothness of the picture that helps you put things back <laughs> together again, right? So here is exactly the same thing, but in PDE speak. This is a partial differential equation in space and time. Some Gensbrook Langdon, when we see space with temporal patterns. And as the thing comes out of the computer, you take it and you pass it through a shredder in the office, and you get 512 time series. And then you mix them up. So there is space, but you destroy it. You just mix it up. And what you get is this. And you're looking at these time series and you're asking, what was the picture? Well, each of these time series is a data point. If you do data mining between these data points, you will find that there is a one parameter family of data points. And if you order them by their principal component in this first principal direction, then what you're going to get is something that is one to one with the original space. And if you're really careful, you will see that actually you get a flip. Because if somebody looks like you, you don't know who is on the right and who is on the left. So you get either yourself or a flip with yourself. So this is a place where there is geometry. You mess up the geometry, and then you get it back again by data mining. And this is the same idea in two dimensions. This is the 2 dxy plus time PDE. You take the cube of data, and you push it through a neat grinder. You get a whole bunch of time series here, 40,000. You analyze all of these time series, and you figure out, gee, it's a two-parameter perimeter time series. You put the, the data next to each other based on which one, not who is close to whom, but who looks like whom, who has the same behavior. You try to put neighbors next to each other based on what they do, not what they are. And what you find is that you get a picture that is a one-to-one -one transformation of the original geometry. And if you're really careful, you see that this also happened to be a flip. This is the same thing in numerical analysis speak. When you discretize such an equation of finite, finite differences, you get these tri-diagonal, pentadiagonal matrices, 
Then you look at this and say, ah, this is a 2D problem based on the number of diagonals. Yeah, but to get these diagonals, you must number the nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 21, 22, 31. If you number the nodes randomly, then what is a very nice bounded structure becomes a horrible mess, like some sort of well, adjacent matrix of some network. But if you don't look at the order of the nodes, but you look at what happens at every node and rearrange the numbering of the nodes so that nearby take points give you nearby behavior, then you get back to two dimensional space. So what I've shown you is a lot of problems where there was space and I mess it up on purpose. And then I can recover it. And now here is something which is more interesting. This comes from old work of Steve Stobbitt. There is a whole bunch of oscillators. They, each one of them are so they're not just phase oscillators, they're phase and amplitude. They are all slightly different and they're all coupled. And this is the initial condition. You see, there's a funny color on them. I kind of knew just how to color them so that if I run them, you will see that they very quickly organize themselves along this curve. And then as time goes on and the curve is evolving, this order along the arc length of the curve persists. Turns out that the color has to do with the heterogeneity of the oscillators. Each one of them has a different intrinsic frequency. So what I'm telling you is that you look at the behavior and the behavior itself tells you that this is a one parameter family of oscillators and the position of the oscillator along this curve corresponds to how different they are. And if you plot things not by X, Y, but you plot things based on the arc length on this curve, mm -hmm. then the behavior looks like a partial differential equation. In this variable, which you don't know about at the beginning, it comes out from observing the behavior itself. So this is a problem where, let me tell you what the main idea is. The main idea is here. I have all of these oscillators. I don't know what their intrinsic properties are. If I look at what the first, the second, the second hundredth does, it looks like this. But if I look at their behavior and rearrange their order based on the similarity of their behavior, then what I get is a field in a variable that I did not know of at the beginning. So this is an emergent, good help as variable. This is an emergent space. So that if you describe the behavior in this space, then the behavior is smooth. And so what we did is that we found the emergent space in which the behavior is smooth. And then if you plot in that space, the behavior in spatial temporary looks like an oscillation of a PCE. And what we did is that we used all the machinery that I told you before to learn the operator, not in the original embedding space, which was crap, the oscillator, you know, the behavior was bananas, but in a space where the behavior is smooth, therefore you can learn a nice partial differential equation and its bifurcations. Let me give you a non-trivial example. This is 1,024 Hodgkin Huxley neurons. This has something to do with modeling the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and they are all different for two reasons. They are different because they are intrinsically different, their kinetics are different. And they are different because they are structurally different. They are sitting on a Chung Mu network. So it's not a small world, it's not all 12. There's many different numbers of connections between the different neurons. You run them, these you get you get 1024 slightly different trajectories. But if you take these 1024 slightly different oscillations and do that analysis, then you find that they are a two-parameter family of oscillations. And you can create a space that is based on processing the data such that if you put the neurons based on their behavior, then if you look at the behavior of the neurons in the space, you cannot imagine how happy I was when I first looked this movie. It shows you how weird sometimes we are. What you see here is the behavior of the network, but it's the behavior of the network embedded in a space where the network nodes are like discretization points. And then you have a very nice field and a partial differential equation. And here is some of the interpretability for you. I go to the previous slide. This is the data-driven space. If you color the data-driven space by the kinetic heterogeneity, you see that one of the latent variables is practically one-to-one -one with the kinetic heterogeneity. 
And if you cover the data by the degree of the neuron in the network, you see that the second data driven variable is actually one to one with the degree of the neuron in the network. This is fortuitous, it didn't have to be. I'm just telling you how do you try to do interpretability? You find how many things matter. You take pairs of people, the things that physically matter, and you try to find which are one to one with each other. Jan? Yes. Is there any <clears throat> theoretical analysis why there is a unique mapping? Like, do you know in advance for a system the dimensionality of the. No. It, it comes up. It comes up. Right. Would, would it be nice? So, so you postulate. The no, you don't. No, you analyze the data and. Uh, you're all familiar with uh, when we do principal components. So it comes to the yeah, sort yeah. of pre plot of how many things yeah. matter and how many not. It's not as simple as that, but it's the yeah. same idea. You have to decide how much stuff matters. You might be wrong. Sorry. Okay. Now, in what I showed you, I shred space and kept time. But it's also possible to shred time and keep space. There was a company in California such that. If you gave them, if you found in your grandparents' house a drawer full of pictures, then you would give it to them and you'd pay some money, I don't know how much it was, and then they would put them in order. So it's the same idea. You take the PD, you shred it, and then you have all of these snapshots, you analyze them, it's a one parameter family of snapshots, you recover, it's not the true time, but something that's one to one with the true time. And you can take the same picture and now take a cookie cutter, not just space or time, but little patches of space time, and you can take all of these things and use the same puzzle to solve these things and put them back in order. What's the point of this? The point of what I'm showing you so, this is the Kuramoto Sevashin scheme, which we spend a lot of our time with the dress on it. One space dimension in time, you see that it's traveling, but the traveling is not constant speed, it's modulated traveling wave, so the behavior is a torus. One frequency for the modulation and one for the traveling. And the important thing is you can sit at different points in space you have know, observations of short time series or you can sit at different moments in time and take little snapshots in space or you can take little patches of space time or you can even have moving observers the idea is that you can take all of these very different but rich enough measurements of the same things and analyze the data in such a way so that no matter what we have observed, we get the same embedding. So the idea is have very different observations of the same thing, but do your data mining in a way that does not depend on how you measure, as long as you measure rich enough. The physics world would be a gauge invariant transformation. And if you have read about neural networks that embody symmetries, then there is also a gate invariant neural networks so that, for example, don't, don't care about the permutation of the image. And I want to give you a little feeling of this because this is the thing that we need to care about a lot. Okay? Suppose that this is the perfect way of looking at a phenomenon. So this is a, an intrinsic space, a divine space, a platonic space. Now this is what I observe with my eyes and let's say this is Ulysses here with his eyes. So when we do data mining, you know that we can take two nearby data points and then we use, let's say, for example, we use a Gaussian kernel, we use a similarity measure and our data mining is based on working with these kernels. Okay, so in the platonic space, this would be the distance between the events. Now, my observation, my eyes, I, I don't see perfectly, I don't have a diagonal observation curve. I have this blue observation curve, which is one to one with Plato, but not exactly what Plato sees. Then when these events happen, I am going to see a distorted distance between these events. So if I do data mining in my space, I will see something very different than what Plato sees in his space. And if Ulysses has the green observation curve, his distances are also going to be very different. Here's the trick. If I don't only observe the point, so there is extra information. I don't only observe the point, but I look at the covariance of the noise in the neighborhood of the points. Then in my observation, what is a circle here gives me a slightly deformed ellipse. And what's a circle here gives me a slightly deformed ellipse. And the slope or the 
axis, is the, the, the direction of the axis of this ellipse, is basically giving me an estimate of the Jacobian of the transformation. How bad are my glasses looking? And if I take my distance and scale it by the slope of my glasses, then I will get to great accuracy in this. That Singer and Koisman 2008 in applied and computational harmonic analysis. And if Ulysses sees the same noise in his world and scales his distances with these slopes, then he will also get the same thing. And so the idea is that with extra information, this is not without trouble, with this extra information of jiggling the experiment, you could do the data analysis in a way that does not care if you observed it with this instrument or that instrument, too high or not. And a couple of years ago, we had an, this problem can be solved with eigenproblems, but actually we created this and we called this a local conformal autoencoder. This is an autoencoder that doesn't take only as input the data, takes the data and the observation of the covariance with the noise around the data and tries to map them into an intrinsic space. What's the intrinsic space? Are the intrinsic space here is the place where the noise becomes z squared. So, in my opinion, this is one of the big things in machine learning. You can work with your observables, or you can work with any other observables you want. And in particular, you would like to ask, what are the observables in which the behavior is beautiful? Beautiful might be easier to compute with. Beautiful might be linear. Beautiful might be integrably possible. Is there, what I'm trying to tell you is that, in my opinion, one of the biggest things that machine learning does for us is that it allows us to try and search for the transformation that make the problem nicer, easier, easier to compute with. While up to now, the main space we've been working is the space in which we can understand the physics, in which we can write a compact equation. We don't have to work with compact equations anymore. You know, at least in what we were doing, you can guess you can get three equations, but the three equations are 70 pages. Well, these days, what do we care if it is three lines or 70 pages? The equations are sitting in a subroutine anyway. What I'm trying to say is that we are allowed to ask what is the space in which the behavior of the problem is as simple as possible. If you want to take something and translate it into normal form and work with the normal form. So uh, this is an illustration of this. Yeah, okay. So last thing that I'm going to tell you the pictures. This is from the singer and question paper that I told you. This is the data. This is one invertible deformation of the data. This is another invertible deformation of the data. You do the data analysis the way that I told you by observing the correlation of the covariance of the noise. Both of them become squares, and now they are within orthogonal transformations of each other. It's very easy with very few matching points to put them together. And uh, we've worked a lot on this. I would maybe just finish with a couple of pictures. It is 255. Hmm. So the main statement that I want to say is that in the Renaissance, People discovered perspective, the point at infinity, the projective plane, and uh, this actually happens to be Plato and this is Socrates. I think they put a lot of effort into trying to plot exactly what they were seeing. So they wanted to make a model that looks exactly like the measurement. Okay. Then photography came, and uh, it was very easy to plot what you see. So people started to try to express different emotions and different environments and different whatevers. And so if you think of truth, so this is the Vitruvian man by Leonardo, if you make a model of the truth, you would like the model to be a very nice mirror, show you exactly what you see. And if the model is a little bit off, then you could ask yourself, what is the mirror that will take the model and back it, back, back, you know, how to calibrate the model to the truth? But now we can have a different idea. The idea is, here is oscillation for a laser problem. Here is oscillation for a chemical problem. Here is oscillation for a fluid problem. All of them are realizations of a normal form of the Hopf bifurcation. 
not how do I take my model and map it to the truth, but rather this truth can be mapped to a prototypical normal form. That truth can also be mapped to a prototypical normal form, and that truth can also be mapped to a prototypical normal form. That is, all things that belong to the same universality class, we can use machine learning to find the mapping to the corresponding normal form so that we can do all our computations in the same space, no matter if the oscillations were from this, that, or the other. And we can even combine information from chemistry and laser, which as long as we know that the problem comes from the same universality, that's the same normal. So bottom line, in addition to solving a number of problems, machine learning allows us to change the view, the way that we look at our data, and now the real last, last, last thing that they will show you is one line that comes from a Greek uh, author from the beginning of the 20th century. And if I don't find it, then I will, okay, I'll tell it to you. This is Nikos Kazandakis. He says, if we cannot change reality, let us at least change the eyes with which we do it. And the idea is that, in my opinion, the big thing about machine learning is that it allows us change the eyes with which we see reality so that we can benefit from the way that we see i know it sounds very blah blah and it is very blah blah but i think there is something thank you